Uh, surviving. <laughs> First of all, he's a survivor. When we were growing up, my dad never talked about the war, never. It was only 20, 30 years ago that he started talking about his prisoner of war experience. I just sort of suspect that he figured his life was a do-over. Like, he probably should have died when he was 19. Through all his experiences, he was like the world's most optimistic person. He realized how precious life was, and I think he lived the rest of his life uh, with an appreciation for it because of that. He was just fun. He was a fun dad. When he worked, he worked really hard, really long hours, but on the weekend, he was really there for us kids. You know, it's, it's, you know, when you're a kid, you always think your, your dad is amazing and, and perfect. And then as you get older, you just realize that he's a human. And uh, but he's a really good human. I didn't realize how incredible his story was until I actually heard it. When I come to you with my eyes wide open I know you will tell me the truth It'll all be fine We'll remember these times Live up to the dreams of our youth Together we see through shared experience Way for the good life to be Close my eyes, imagine my past The early days, they move so fast A life is shared and forever will be And the story is here to see The story is here to see A short journey from youth to manhood. This recollection is dedicated to my children. Bob Weedlin, August 5th, 1995. For a long time, I didn't want to talk much about this, but I think you are entitled to know about my experiences in the service. No doubt this period had a significant effect in shaping my life and making me the person I am today, for good or bad. He realized how precious life was, and I think he lived the rest of his life uh, with an appreciation for it because of that. It's kind of a battle for him. I mean, there's a side of him where he just gets really cynical and he thinks people are idiots. And, and then there's a part of him that just tries to focus on kindness. He tries to be kind to people. He, um, up till recently, he kept in his car a bunch of little stuffed animals. And if he happened to be, you know, in, you know walking down the street in his the little town in Oregon he lived in. Maybe he'd be like at a coffee shop or something and there'd be a little kid in there. He'd go out to the car and give a kid a you know, stuffed animal, just like out of the blue. And uh, so I think for him, he tried to focus on making sure that kindness was part of his routine. People always referred to him as Peter Pan, not because he was flighty and fruity, is because he was ageless. He had this will to succeed and nothing ever stopped him. He was always full of energy, can-do spirit, never gave up. He was uh, relentless. Well, as Andy said earlier, he's a badass. He was always up for doing something, doing the unusual. You know, despite the fact that he raised us in the 50s and 60s and 70s, he didn't. He wasn't as conventional as uh, other parents. Whatever he did, he he was really into it. That's just the way he approached everything in life. He tried to be as good as he could be at at anything, whether it was skiing, you know, playing cards, fishing, uh, any sporting activity. 
He's very modest, as are most people from the Midwest. He's very humble. He underplays a lot of his talents. And one thing I always thought was interesting about him is he's always insisted that he wasn't the creative type, which is the exact opposite. He's so creative. He was loving and he was a great dad and father, um, husband, but um, he, if he wanted to do something, he'd do it. He wasn't going to be cheated out of a minute of life. I think that he turned out so different from his parents. And my dad's big thing is my dad never said, I love you to me, never mm -hmm. once said that. And that's why he feels like he needs to say it a lot to us. So I think like his combination of being humble, being creative, and being really smart is what kind of makes him unique. Mm -hmm. And then his whole thing, just being really into teamwork and working together and focusing on other people and making sure other people are okay and other people are happy and having a good time. Well, it's just kind of ingrained in him. I think he liked to have fun. He liked to do exciting things. I mean, he skied. He, uh, we canoed down some crazy rivers. Uh, you know, he wouldn't back down from anything, you know. He was kind of quiet, but he really enjoyed life. He really enjoyed his friends. Um, and he liked working hard. He was just this guy who wanted to live, you know. He never gave up. He was always wanted to try something new. He lived it to the fullest, you know. I mean, he's 91 now, and he's ill and infirm, and he's not doing well. But um, as my niece said, you know, the first 89 years of life, he was a badass. <laughs> and now it's the end. But um, he lived a good life. Through all his experiences, he was like the world's most optimistic person. And even now in his dementia, you know, he thinks his uh, memory care unit thought it was a cruise ship for a, a while. They thought he was on a train going somewhere. Now he thinks he's in Las Vegas, so he's still traveling. My father is someone who truly believes in teamwork, and he believes in bringing the positive. The United States had been at war about 18 months when I graduated from high school. In April 1943, when I was 17 years old, I enlisted in the Army. Basic training was in Fort Benning, Georgia. His mom was like this very much a worry ward, kind of unhappy all the time, always waiting to die. And his dad was a real a-hole, mm. that he was a drunk. When he was playing football in high school, uh, it was a big game, and uh, their kicker got hurt on the opening kickoff, and it was a 0-0 game. Then late in the fourth quarter, their team scored a touchdown, and they... Uh, he ran up to the coach and says, what do we do? We don't have a kicker. And the coach told him, you're the kicker. And uh, so he proceeded to attempt the extra point, kicked it, hit the crossbar, and the ball rolled over for a good extra point. But I thought that was kind of uh, appropriate for the way he, he led his life. He, he was always up for anything. You know, if you look at his parents, it's not like they were the most loving people and he grew up in the depression and he was never identified as being high potential. You know, he's a Weedland, so he's, you know, he's not like super tall, thin and handsome. You know, I, I think he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He was kind of a slacker in uh, school. And I think it was in high school that one of the, I think maybe the principal or something, sat him down after he had taken some general testing thing where he had scored off the charts and everyone had thought he was kind of like this dumb flake. And, I mean, it turns out he was really smart. He just wasn't really applying him himself. And this guy sort of turned my dad around and made him realize that he could do something with his life. I think his family life was not all that great. Mm. I think his dad was kind of a prick. And I think his mom was kind of a emotional wreck. So 
in that context and in the context of living a very Catholic religious upbringing, mm. that seems like just sort of a strange way to be brought up. In spite of all that, I think he was a pretty social person. Mm. And even though maybe he was a, a little bit quiet, I think he really did enjoy people. I think he had a lot of friends. Mm. And so I think that just was his innate personality. I don't think those were things that that he got from his family. I don't think he got those certainly from uh, his religious education or the teachers that he was around. Uh, I just think he liked people. He grew up during the Depression and, you know, was having this great high school career where he played football and was doing track. And then the next thing you know, there's World War II and he's in the war. And He's in the war for all of a week, and then he gets captured by the Germans and spent months in a concentration camp and barely made it out alive. They shipped the entire unit to England. We left New York on a black rainy night and crossed the Atlantic on the Aquitania, the sister ship of the Lusitania, which was sunk by torpedoes in World War I. On board this ship, I was in a compartment six feet by eight feet by nine feet high with 17 other men. Talk about togetherness. If the guy below you rolled over, his hips would hit yours through the canvas bunk. He did a few things when he was in the prisoner of war camp that I think really kind of tell about his personality. He smoked cigarettes, and his dad died of lung cancer. His dad was like a three, four pack a day smoker. And, and at that point, you know, my dad was, they were, everybody was a smoker. And that the Red Cross would send these care packages and they'd send like a Hershey's chocolate bar, pack of cigarettes, a couple penicillins, and a pair of socks or something. And he thought about it and he figures, you know, I can live without the cigarettes. I might need the penicillin. So he traded people cigarettes for their penicillin mm. and ended up saving both his life and his friend's life. So... Um, pretty smart for a 19-year-old that whose life is basically impulsivity. We arrived where the Belgium, Luxembourg, and German borders meet. We bivouacked in a forest about 20 miles from the front. It was cold and wet. The snow would melt during the day and then freeze at night. My feet never got dry from the time we waded off the landing craft. We had a small fire and my feet were so cold I put them in the fire. Of course, the heels of my shoes burned off and I had to throw the shoes away. I had an extra pair in my barrack bag. The next morning, in pitch dark, we ordered to move out. One morning I awoke and there, halfway into my tent, was the biggest, boniest, ugliest white hog I have ever seen. He scared the hell out of this city boy. I kicked him in the snout and he backed out of the tent making very rude noises. I think that that experience really changed him. And I think it taught him to think ahead. Because, I mean, you know, you're 18 years old. Thinking ahead is not exactly the long suit of 18-year-old, 19-year-old uh, boys. So I think that that was, was a very pivotal thing. And, and I think maybe that is where he got his joy for living is after that experience. I mean, he had fun in high school. Uh, I don't, he wasn't really career bound, I guess, because of the war. I don't think anyone was that focused on what they wanted their career to be. We arrived at the front and it was a very spooky experience. We were in thick woods in low mountains. There were rifles wired to trees as booby traps all over the place. The company we replaced had gone in on D-Day six months earlier. Since D-Day, they had 867 replacements. That meant in six months, every man in the outfit had been replaced 4.6 times. There were only two men left from the original outfit, the company commander and the supply sergeant. Even the cooks had all been casualties. After that, he went off to the war, and then he came back and met my mom, fell in love, went to college, became a dentist, and then became an oral surgeon and had like this super successful, motivated and focused career.
While standing guard at night, I thought I heard snow crunching, so I looked around carefully while staying concealed. Then I saw him. He was crouching low and walking not more than 20 yards away and uphill from me. I quietly slipped the safety off on my rifle and strained to see if it was a whole German patrol or just a single infiltrator. I couldn't see the sights on my rifle, but I aimed as best as I could. Since I only saw one man, I decided to take my chance and called, Halt! Who goes there? Jesus, it's me. Don't shoot, came the reply. It was a GI from the next bunker who went out to take a whiz and got lost in the dark. I was really shaken. I almost shot one of my own comrades. He came back and, you know, he was hospitalized for quite some time. And um, he came back really wanting to go to college. And his first taste of college was at this officer school at Auburn University, where he was there just for a short amount of time and then they shipped them all out. But he was like, you know, I kind of like this learning stuff. <laughs> and so, so he got a taste of it there. If you look over his life, you know, kind of raised in hard scrabble Chicago and made it through the war and made it through medical school and became a doctor and very successful life, but uh, it wasn't like anything was given to him. Uh, as a professional, uh, as an oral surgeon, I think he trained a lot of people. And I think there are a lot of people that went through his training that are tremendously grateful uh, and respectful of what he had to offer them. I know their eyes light up when they talk about my dad. Uh, so he had a great combination of having um, an unspoken expectation of excellence, uh, but he found a way to make, let these guys or allow these guys to succeed. So men and women. In his career, he was one of the pioneers that created dental implants, which is just so huge. He, he did a lot of the research and testing on humans. <laughs> um, so he was right there in the early stages of that. And I think that that's super cool. And it's like, it really changed everything in dentistry. He did some pioneering work in oral surgery. Remember one story he told me about, uh, uh, he was treating a patient that had uh, bone cancer in his jaw, and his jaw basically was just rotted away due to the radiation treatment, so he didn't, he didn't have a lower jaw, so he and another doctor um, took up one of the guy's ribs and bent it and formed it into the shape of a jaw and inserted it, and this is pretty much ahead of his time. This is back in probably the 70s. I think he's proud to be an oral surgeon and a renowned oral surgeon. I think he was proud to give back in terms of being a teacher and a professor at UCLA and USC. When he had private practice, he was an oral surgeon and one summer I even worked in his office and my job was to like clean the extracted teeth and the bloody instruments and stuff. And one of the things I had to do was take the teeth that were filled with gold and set them aside. And my dad collected all this gold. And over the years, I remember in our garage on the shelves, there were these like miracle, empty miracle whip jars of gold just sitting in the garage, right? And he used to take the gold and melt it down and make one of a kind jewelry for my mother out of it, which was so cool. We were awakened just before dawn by a huge artillery barrage. They weren't hitting our positions, but seemed to be concentrating north of us. Since my mortar was assigned to this area, we fired about 10 rounds. Apparently, we got a lucky hit on the half-track and wounded a lot of their infantry assault team. Most of the unit attacking us apparently withdrew as they really had walked into a, a hornet's nest. Lieutenant O'Neill yelled in German for the rest to surrender. There was a lot of German yelling back and forth, but nobody surrendered. So Lieutenant O'Neill got out of his foxhole and walked right into the attackers and started shooting anyone that didn't have his hands up. Pretty soon, a whole bunch of Germans surrendered. Then something unforgettable happened. First one, then several GIs drew their knives and approached the Germans, who were obviously terrified. A massacre, hardly. All the GIs wanted was to cut a few buttons off the Germans' coats for souvenirs. I think he would say his accomplishments are his children because 
he probably feels social pressure to say that, but I do think he's genuinely proud of the five of us. He was a good father. You know, he raised five kids, and you know, I think we all turned out pretty good. So I think a lot of that was because of him. I think that he raised five kids that came out really functional and um, and pretty happy. And I think that's a tremendous legacy uh, to get to do that. I mean, you'd think out of five, someone would have screwed up, at least looking around. It seems like the odds would have been pretty good. And, you know, for the most part, we came out okay. I think he was proud to have a family and have kids that grew up and were relatively well adjusted. He raised a, a great family. Uh, I think everyone, you know, all of his kids turned out well. No one's in trouble. They're all sufficient, self-sufficient. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone's got their little quirks and whatnot, but we're all, I think, happy people and successful. And, you know, it's attributable, attributable to both my dad and my mom. I guess one of the things I think about when I think back on my, my dad and, and just his, the way he was in the world was he was extremely confident. In my interactions as, as a son, I, I guess there was a certain expectation that we would be competent as well. I mean, there was just, it's not like he would say things like that. It was more like leading by example. I certainly had no interest in going into dentistry or medicine, but whatever, you know, I chose to do, um, I wanted to do it well. And I think that um, the example by living um, was, uh, was profound. We marched all day with little or no resistance in bivouac in a small woods in a valley. Everyone was exhausted. I had to force my men to dig in because we were all just pooped out. We hadn't eaten for a couple of days and we were out of water. The next morning, December 19th, 1944, we heard tanks moving all around us. An infantry man's nightmare. Our artillery had been captured the day before and the weather prevented any air support. We had no anti-tank guns. The tanks began firing into the woods. I jumped for my hole, but someone beat me to it. He wasn't from my squad. I put my rifle in his ear and I said, I'm pulling the trigger in three seconds. He got out of my hole and I got in. I didn't dig my hole in total exhaustion to save someone else's butt. Well, he was kind of a crazy driver uh, in that he would get so involved in talking and looking at the road while I was driving and he would say, oh, look at that, and he'd point to the side of the road and of course, of course the car would follow where he was pointing and scare everyone half to death. My dad comes home from work with a new car, a Triumph Spitfire. At one point, my dad, much to the chagrin of my mother, went out and bought a two-seater sports car convertible. Mom freaked out, but it was too late. My dad was determined, and that was their dynamic a lot was that. I remember my mom walking out and looking at him. She says, I don't know you, <laughs> and just absolutely rolling her eyes. But we loved that car. On the weekends, he used to pile all five of us kids into that two-seater car with the top down, no seat belts, us sitting like on the back of the car and stuff, mm -hmm. and drive us a couple miles to Thrifty Drug Store where he would buy us nickel ice creams. And those are some of my favorite memories, like how many people <laughs> with five kids buy a two-seater <laughs> car? <laughs> so. That was just such a strong memory of, of being a kid in California and growing up. We had to cross an open pasture to get to the next woods. It was like a pool table with no vegetation except very short grass and no gullies or depressions in which to take cover. A machine gun opened up on us from my right. I hit the ground and flattened myself as much as I could. 
Apparently, every sixth bullet was a tracer and they looked like orange balls of fire coming at me. I was sort of fascinated by them as they seemed to almost float and then dive right at me. They all looked like they would hit me right between the eyes. I could hear them sizzle in the mud right next to my head. Surprisingly, I felt rather calm and my feelings were not of terror or fear so much as profound sadness, overwhelming sadness. I'll never have a full and fruitful life. It's going to end here. Like I said, it was kind of, it was fun and scary hanging around with them because we had some, we had some scary times together. I almost got drowned with them once on a, on a canoe trip when I was probably, I don't know, 11 years old, 12 years old. We were canoeing down this river in Wisconsin and it was in fall, it was raining, the, the water was really going fast. And, Anyway, we got turned sideways going down to rapids and punched a hole in the canoe and we sunk and all of our equipment went scattered downstream. And we were in the middle of nowhere and there was nothing within many, many miles of us. And it was kind of scary, but, you know, he, he didn't let on that we were in trouble, although we really were. And, uh, you know, he got us through it, and finished the trip, and that was fine, <laughs> you know. He was on a senior baseball team that won the Senior Olympics, and um, he was the manager, although he complained bitterly. It, it was actually a weird thing with, with this baseball team. They all called themselves by, like, childhood names. Hmm. Like, they'd call, you know, Bobby, Johnny, you know, Stevie, run the bases. I mean, they all called each other by, like, childhood kind of names, juvenile names. Mm -hmm. But... Um, he was the manager, and there was just tons of complaining. I can play second base. And it's like, you can't run. No, you can't play second, you know. So that part was hard, but he, but he loved it. And my mom would come, and she'd do that elaborate scoring on those special scorecards for him so he could go back and relive the game afterwards. I think what made him unique was he was a winner, and yet, he had nothing handed to him. It wasn't like um, he was supposed to be a winner. I got up and ran for the woods. Before I got there, I saw my gunner, Carl, pulling a big piece of shrapnel out of someone's shoulder. The mortar was on the ground. Carl had not abandoned it. I picked up the mortar and yelled, follow me, Carl. When I reached the woods, I looked back and Carl wasn't there. I never knew what happened to him until 1993 when we met at the 106th Division Reunion. They assigned a guard to march us to a stone farmhouse a few miles up the road where we were placed in the basement. As I sat on the floor of the basement, it hit me. I was a POW. I joined the Army at age 17 and trained hard to be a good soldier. I traveled thousands of miles to face the enemy, and here I was. I was consumed with a combination of anger, embarrassment, shame, and frustration that I should have failed so miserably. I put my face in my hands and wept. I couldn't stop sobbing. One of the men said to Lieutenant Dahoney, what's wrong with Weedlin? He replied, some people just take it harder than others. Maybe he should have added, some people are more mature than others. I used to play Pop Warner football when I was a kid from like probably age 10 to 14 or something like that. And my dad would always show up for my practices, which was really sweet. I mean, he's got five kids. He's got to sp split his time. But he managed to find a way, you know, at, I don't know, when practices ended. It was evening time. It was fall. It was dark by the time we quit. But he'd show up, and he had this big kind of like corduroy green trench overcoat and this kind of fedora hat, and he'd be smoking a cigar and had his glasses on. And everyone thought he was like the second coming of Vince Lombardi. You know, he'd just be sitting there on the sidelines, you know, clenching, clenching his cigar, watching the game, and, and then, you know, he'd take me home and we'd talk about football, and uh, it was nice. It was really, really nice to be able to spend time with him. So he made time for me. Whenever we had a family party or whatever, my dad always made it his mission to make sure the party was fun and that there was dancing and singing. 
he kind of definite, well, kind of, he definitely instilled that in me. Like, I feel this moral obligation to entertain people and make sure people have a good time. We walked from daylight to dusk 25 miles with no food and only one water stop. We were given three crackers and it was only my second meal in five days. We were so exhausted we laid down on a pile of frozen sand in an open shed and slept. The next morning we were placed in little box cars, 60 men to a car. Apparently the previous occupants had been cattle because the floor was covered with excrement. It was so crowded that we had to organize it so half of the men stood up while the other half sat. Then at the proper time, the first half would get to sit while the second shift stood up. The men were disciplined and no fights occurred because of the crowding. You can't imagine what it is like to be so closely confined for so long. We were in the cars for two more days, a total of four days of horror. Perhaps this was the most excruciating torment of the entire event. Packed so tightly we could barely move, squatting for four days in excrement and urine, with pain in every joint of my body, craving water, craving food, craving rest. We were forced to bear the unbearable. He was a fun guy to, to hang out with, and he, he did a lot of crazy things with us. And he was pretty much up for anything that was fun. He went skydiving when he was 70 years old or something ridiculous. I think I was in high school, and he was kind of being odd on a Saturday. He didn't, for some reason, he couldn't go see my soccer game. He's like, oh, I got things to do. And, he was gone all day and he came back with a shirt that said, I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane. And so without telling anybody, he went and went parachuting for the day. That kind of stupidity. We were all called into a special barracks for interrogation. The army had told us that if we were taken prisoner, a very unlikely event, they said, we were to give only our name, rank, and serial number. Roland and I agreed that we were not going to give those blockheads anything but name, rank, and serial number. It went like this. Name, Robert A. Weedlin. Rank, Private First Class. Serial number, 16174601. Unit, I don't want to answer that. Home address, I don't want to answer. This guy went on and asked all 180 questions, and I gave him the same answer. He never changed expression or showed annoyance. The guards made us stand outside with no gloves on. It was cold. They wouldn't allow us to talk, but we did whisper encouragement to each other when we could. Every hour or so, this little corporal would come out and say, You're all crazy. You're going to freeze to death out here. Later, he held up a stack of forms that were filled out. And we have thousands of these, including those from your officers. That kind of got to me. I couldn't feel my feet anymore. Even the pain was gone. I said, Raleigh, they are going to leave us out here until we are frozen to the ground. He agreed. We discussed it with the others and decided that if 3,000 men filled their forms out, what difference would 12 more make? We agreed that we gave it our best shot, but we didn't want to die for nothing. We decided to answer the questionnaire with false answers. It's kind of funny that all 12 of us claimed that our military occupation was cook. He's very grounded. He's very technically oriented, but he has, he has a pretty strong artistic side to him um, that I certainly don't have. And it comes out in different ways. I mean, it's not like he's necessarily painting portraits or anything like that, but just I think the way that um, he approaches problems, he's, he's actually very creative. And uh, the... The surgery aspect of what he does, I think, translates into a lot of things that he can do with his hands that um, most people can't. And just the way his mind works, I think he finds ways to solve problems in very creative ways. When my kids were little, their whole thing, you know, they knew their dad couldn't, you know, plug in a lamp. But they knew anything that needed fixing or building, they knew that they could go to uh, their papa and, and he would be able to do it. And my daughter, when she was like four maybe, three and a half, four, she saw a dollhouse and she drew up these plans 
and didn't tell me about it. I didn't know anything about it. When we went to my dad, she takes it and she goes, and goes, can you build me this? And she wanted a cupboard that opened and it has to have a staircase and it has to have a fireplace. And he did this elaborate, elaborate dollhouse that we still have. I got sick the first month of captivity. I was still living on my fat deposits, but then I got dysentery. I lost weight rapidly and could barely lift myself off the bunk. I couldn't eat. What I was able to get down came back up. Roland took care of me, forced me to eat. In a few weeks, I started to come out of it. One morning, we noticed that the Jewish barracks was empty. The Germans had sent 300 men on a work detail, of which about half were Jews. I never knew what happened to them until after the war. They had been sent to a work camp. After 10 weeks, only 80 of the 300 were still alive. Around the middle of February, the guards took us in groups of 20 to a building outside the fences. They said we were going to get showers. Rumors spread in the military. We had heard the Germans were herding people into shower rooms and killing them with gas. No one believed the stories, and we passed it off as a sick joke. Nevertheless, when we went into this large room, I could not help but think of these stories. You can't believe how relieved I was to see water come out of the shower heads. It was ice cold water and the room was unheated, but it was still the first shower I had in 10 or 12 weeks and the only shower from November 1944 to April 1945. He had a body sense of humor that I always loved. He is just so funny. My mom and dad used to always come to the Go-Go's concerts and see us perform when, when we were in California. He was so, so proud of us. And they really stuck out in the crowd because the whole crowd at that time, especially back in the 80s, was all young girls young and young women. Um, so a lot of the time, especially when we were at our height, girls would approach him and say, what are you doing here? Because he just didn't fit in. And he would say he was the Go-Go's gynecologist. <laughs> that. And so every year Ron and Uncle Dick and my dad would go up deer hunting mm -hmm. and my dad was from the Midwest and um, hunter, fisherman. I'm not sure he really enjoyed it that much. I think he appreciated the camaraderie and every year they'd go deer hunting and they really never really shot much. They never brought home venison. One day they were driving up and my Uncle Dick was absolutely sure that this was the year that they were going to get a big deer. Uh, my dad and Ron Casey sort of conspired to play a joke on my Uncle Dick. So they were walking out in the woods and beforehand they had placed a giant stuffed deer in a clearing. And, you know, it's no wonder they didn't catch anything because they're like talking and drinking and walking through the woods. And my dad goes, hey, Dick, look, there's a deer. And Dick's like, oh, holy shit, and, you know, loads the gun, making all this noise, and boom, he goes, I think I got him, boom, I think I got him. And all this, like, stuffing is coming out into the clearing, and it was just an elaborate, practical joke that my dad had played on my uncle. I was lying in my bunk, third tier up, around 11 a.m., when I heard a lot of shouting and people running. Then I heard it, that very attention-getting sound of machine gun fire. I did a swan dive off my bunk and hugged the floor. What the hell happened? Everyone was yelling at once. We finally pieced it together. An American fighter plane was on the German plane's tail, firing. The German plane was on fire and by plan or accident, dove on the camp. All his guns were firing. The American plane was right behind with all his guns firing at the German. Days later, I heard shouting and running again. No air raid this time. It was a beautiful Sherman tank driving right through the barbed wire fences. We thought we had died and gone to heaven. A lot of good guys did die, but not Roland Upton and Bob Weedlin. I was 19 years old. The tank crewmen were crying when they saw what terrible shape we were in. They threw all their rations out of the tank to the POWs crowded around. We once took a big family trip to June Lake. And, which is in the Sierras. And um, it was super snowy and we were all skiing. My daughter had taken her first ski lesson and 
she was rather fearless. She was definitely fearless. So we're all up there. We're all, you know, standing around getting ready to go down the hill. And she goes, oh, so now we go down, right? And she turns her skis, points straight down, and goes straight down this hill. And this is after, like, you know, two hours of lessons. And I, of course, couldn't do anything about it. So my dad races after her and then skis backwards in front of her down the mountain. You know, he put his pole up like this and he literally skied backwards down the mountain. And she was fine and she was, oh, let's do that again. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> my heart. <laughs> yeah, that's, that would be my dad. Just uh, finding ways to get things done, not getting aggro about it, uh, no big deal. The next event is not clear to me, but I remember waiting in line for something or other and I felt dizzy. When I woke up, I was in a field hospital with a bunch of medics staring down at me. They explained that I had passed out and was brought there by ambulance. After a few days, they sent me by ambulance to a real hospital. It must have been a Catholic hospital because these little French nuns would come around and take my temperature and blood pressure every few hours. I was in the hospital in Paris only a few days. They even let me out for several hours. I strolled the streets of the City of Lights. Then I went by C-47 to southern England for another few days. In the hospital in Lincolnshire, I met a couple of men from my company and we managed to go over the wall every night to party in town. So here I am 50 years later. I have a wife whom I love dearly. I have wonderful children who I love and am fiercely proud of. I have lived a full and fruitful life. Although I have difficulty expressing my affection, I want my children to know how much I love them and how happy and proud I am to be their father, your dad. And every time I use that phrase, nickel ice cream, I'm like, holy crap, I am so old. Even if it took three days, I was totally okay with just staying where we were. And he just said, nope, nope, we're going to cross, we're going to cross. We had to take off our skis and crab walk along the side of this mountain where it was, you know, like a 200 foot drop below us and, you know, I thought, oh, one slip and we're dead. Battling seasickness to get into freezing cold water and swim around with seals and sharks. Like, he loved it. I hated it, but um, he loved it. There's all those tiny little, zillions of tiny little ads and one jumped out at him, and it was a reunion of his prisoner of war squad.